Chapter 14 Verstolen was standing on the west side of the river with Groslick's men amidst a cluster of low buildings. He checked to see that his pistol was loaded and primed to fire. The campaign was going well. All the major bridges were now in Groslick's hands, and they'd made inroads into the poorer parts of the western bank. It seemed that wherever they chose to assault, they had a victory. Lightor's men were demoralized and divided. By contrast, Groslick's were disciplined and effective. Verstolen's regard for the man as a commander had only grown. Keep it quiet, whispered Euler. Let's make this quick and easy, one then at a time. The fighting here was house to house. No one knew where Lightorf was holed up. The race to find him was intense. Groslick had promised a hundred gold crowns for his head, which had encouraged a good deal of enthusiasm for finding him. Following a vague lead, Euler's band had ended up in the smallest alley in the poor quarter. The walls were tall and narrow. As they crept down it, even the dominating Averberg was lost to view, as were the baking rays of the sun. That would have been a comfort had it not been for the refuse piled knee-high at alleyway's base. In some sections, it felt like they were wading through slurry. The men went watchfully. Their numbers had swelled since the start of the campaign, and there were now thirty of them in the company. Euler crept up to the door at the end of the fitted alleyway. Rubbish was piled against it, and the wooden frame looked half-rotten. A terrible place for a hideout, but Lightdorf was no doubt running out of bolt holes. Plenty of terrified citizens of the poor quarter had pointed them in this direction. For the most part, they didn't care which of the warring factions won the control of the city, they just wanted the fighting to end. Euler listened at the door for a few seconds. Stepping carefully, regretting the mess the grime had made of his expensive Zellenhof boots, Verstolen joined him. He placed his ear against the pitted surface of the wood. There was some noise from within, but too faint to make out. Movement, perhaps. Are you sure about this? said Verstolen, his voice low. Euler shrugged. It's a lead. Got any better targets? None. Let's get it over with, then. The two men stepped back from the door. Euler placed his foot over the flimsy lock and kicked savagely. The door swung open on rusty hinges, and they charged in. There was a dingy chamber beyond, lit by dirt-streaked windows on one wall and a series of tallow candles on another. The smell was overpowering. Several men sat around a table in the center. They were armed, if poorly, and jumped up as soon as Euler and Verstolen burst in. In such an irregular war, it was impossible to tell at first glance who was fighting for whom, but they had a look of Lightdorf's men, holed up away from the fiercest fighting. Verstolen stepped to one side, took careful aim, and sent a bullet spiraling in the face of the nearest man. The man spun backwards, his cries of surprise cut cruelly short. Euler flew at the next nearest, knocking him back with a furious swipe of the sword. Then the rest of the men were in the chamber, tearing at the inhabitants. Blades flashed out in the semi-darkness, and blood splattered on the filth-strewn floor. There was no way out, no rear exit. The fighting was mercifully brief. Lightor's men put up a token struggle, but they were outnumbered and taken unawares. Verstolen took little part in it and put his pistol in the holster. Do not kill them all, he cried. By then there was one survivor cowering in the corner. He had no weapon and seemed older than the others. Euler held up his hand and the assault stopped. Six men lay dead on the floor five of them light dwarfs. Euler went to the man in the corner. He was skinny, almost emaciated, with lank hair that hung to his shoulder. His skin was a pale gray 
almost blue in the folds of flesh under his eyes. He looked utterly wretched. As Euler stood over him, the man scrabbled to get even further back into the corner, like a trapped animal in a cage. Leave this to me, said Verstolen, walking over to the corner. Euler shrugged. As you wish. We'll have a look around. Verstolen squatted down, facing the trembling figure. The man smelled as bad as everything else. The heat had turned half of Averheim into a cesspit. What is your name? asked Verstolen, keeping his voice calm. The man stared back at him, wide-eyed, and said nothing. He seemed to have some trouble focusing. Verstolen leaned forward and sniffed. Somewhere, buried beneath the layers of body odor, halitosis and excrement, there was an element of jasmine. A joy root user. Verstolen had begun to wonder whether Lightdorf had stamped a trade out amongst his followers. Where do you get your supply? The man shook his head, still trembling. It was as if his mouth had been glued together. Verstolen couldn't decide whether the man was terrified of him or just generally terrified. The narcotic was certainly capable of inducing paranoia. There's nothing more for us here, said Euler, coming to stand at his shoulder. You think it's worth questioning this wretch? I do. Will you wait outside for me? Euler nodded. Don't be too long. There are more leads to follow. I could use those gold pieces. The men filed out of the chamber and back into the alley. The last one to leave pulled the door close behind him. Verstolen and the man were alone. I think you understand why I am asking you these things, said Verstolen, fixing the ruined figure with a hard stare. If you choose to give me answers, it will go better for you. The man shook his head, keeping his mouth clamped closed. Then, as if as an afterthought, he spat in Verstolen's face. He shrank back after that, looking even more scared than before. So be it. The spy reached into the coat. As ever, when he retrieved the amulet, the metal was hot. It knew when it was near corruption. Indeed, the device was part of that corruption, just a shard of the horror that still existed at the roof of the world. It was a dangerous thing to use. Dangerous, but invaluable. As Verstolen withdrew the amulet, the man looked at him sidelong. He could obviously sense something, but didn't seem to know what it was. Look at this, ordered Verstolen, and thrust it before the wretch's eyes. Just as had happened with Fromgar, the change was instantaneous. The blurred eyes became sharply focused. The bluish lines around them seemed to pulse with a lurid light as if thick veins had suddenly generated around the lids. The man tried to get up, scrabbling at the stone. His breath started to come in thick wheezes. Verstolen stood and withdrew a few paces. He pulled a pistol from its holster and aimed it at the man's face. Speak to me, he commanded. The red-rimmed eyes blazed. You cannot command me, the man cried, and spittle flew from his mouth. The voice was strange and twisted, like a cross between a man and a woman's. I have the power to kill you. You'd do well to speak to me. The man laughed, and his skeletal chest shuddered with the effort. And what? You'll spare my life? He nearly choked on his laughter and broke into a racking cough. I don't think so. You have no idea about life and death anyway. You're ignorant human, as ignorant as the rest. Maybe so. Why not enlighten me? What do you wish to know?
how the six dimensions of pleasure are interwoven, how the nexus of desire derives from the kernel of nightmare, how the world will end. I can tell you all of this, human, all of this and more. Verstolen ignored the ravings. All cultists thought they had privileged access to arcane secrets. That was what made them so pathetic. To acquire genuine knowledge was a long and difficult process. Expecting it to be handed over on a silver platter in exchange for performing a few rites over a pentagon was tedious in the extreme. Nothing so grand. Tell me about Natasha. Where is she from? The man grinned widely, and his tongue ran around his cracked lips. For the first time, Verstolen noticed how long it was. It looked forked. Ah, the queen. Have you not guessed it? She is a rare one. He seemed to be passing into some kind of rapture. He ran his bony fingers over his body as he spoke. It looked like a grotesque parody of a lover's caress. Why do you call her the queen? You'll see. You'll see. Where is she? Where is Rufus? Nearby. And they have their pets with them. You've seen them already, haven't you? Verstolen felt a twinge of anxiety. That was what he feared. There were still horrors being held in reserve. Groslick's men were pushing on too quickly. They didn't know what they faced. Tell me where Rufus is. A wicked look passed over the man's face. I don't know where he is, but I can tell you where someone else is. Someone you haven't seen for a long time. I'm listening. The cultist reared up like a snake, his hands stretched out in a twisted motion. He looked suddenly delighted, as if a new game had occurred to him. His tongue flickered out. As he rose, his rags fell from his body. Verstolen saw with disgust how diseased his filthy flesh had become. The joy root had become everything to him, more important even than food. He kept the pistol trained carefully. He should have tied him up before applying the amulet. She is at the feet of the master of pain, he cried, his voice increasingly shrill. Her soul writhes in delicious agony under the weight of his glorious debauchery. Verstolen primed the weapon to fire. There was an unholy gleam in the cultist's roomy eyes. Cease this nonsense. Where is Lightdorf? I've seen her in my dreams, Peter Verstolen. Your lovely wife, shriven before the altar of his infinite lust. Do not speak of her. She is damned, Peter Verstolen. Be silent! Damned to an eternity of torment! And there's more! Do you know the worst part? Verstolen stepped forward, his hand shaking. He felt sick. I will fire! Cease this now! She has been corrupted. They corrupted your Leonora. She enjoys it. She... The pistol rang out. The cultist was instantly silenced, flung back against the dirt-caked wall. He slumped to the ground. From his forehead, thick blood pumped from a neat round hole. It was nearly purple. Verstolen stood motionless for a moment, the gun still in position. His hands were trembling. Slowly, with difficulty, he brought his emotions under control. The cultist lay at his feet like a crushed spider, his tortured limbs bent in every direction. Verstolen replaced the gun in the holster and carefully backed away. That had been a mistake. It was foolish to think he could bring an end to this through such means. 
It had all been a mistake. He withdrew, opened the door and stepped outside. Euler was waiting. His men had moved to the far end of the alleyway. Are you all right? asked the captain, looking at him with concern. I am fine. You look like... I am fine. Euler gave him a doubtful stare, then let it drop. Find anything useful? No, he was mad. We need to keep moving. Euler shook his head resignedly. Very well. There's another lead we can follow. He began to walk off down the alley. Verstolen followed close behind, his breathing gradually returning to normal. The cultist had been raving. It was nonsense. They said whatever came into their diseased mind. They wanted to unsettle you. That was their mission, their miserable purpose. Best to ignore. As he went, though, one thought remained lodged in his mind. It wouldn't leave, even when he merged once more into the sunlight of the open street. It knew my wife's name. Even before Helborg had ridden into the outskirts of Averheim, he'd been able to smell the burning. He brought his teeth to a halt. All around him, his men did likewise. The ranks of Reichsguard controlled their mounts perfectly. They stood for a moment, looking at the city before them. The thick columns of smoke hung over Averheim, staining the clear sky. It looked like the place was under siege yet there was no army camped around the walls. Mother of Sigmar, Helborg spat, looking over at Scar. We should have ridden harder. Scar gave him an expression that indicated he didn't think it was possible to have ridden faster, Reichsguard or not. The west gate is nearest, was all he said. We'll have to ride through the poor quarter. Helborg nodded. He knew Averheim. He'd visited as little as possible in the recent years. All the Empire knew of his enmity with the late Marius. As far as Helborg was concerned, the Elector had been an arrogant, raving fool. Through foolishness and lack of foresight. If Schwarzelm hadn't curbed his worst successes twenty years ago, there would have surely been a coup against his authority then. Perhaps... That would have been better. In Helborg's experience, it was generally better to cut out an infection at source than let it grow. Now, twenty years on, they were still dealing with the legacy of the Mad Count, and it looked that even Schwarzhelm had failed to grapple with it. Then again, Schwarzhelm himself was another problem. The man was becoming irascible and difficult, even by his own standards. His behavior at Turgid's had been embarrassing. If it had been another man, Helborg might have run him through for such impertinence. He could admire the man for his martial prowess, and there was no more steadfast ally to have on the field of battle, but Schwarzelm did not understand politics. He made enemies too easily, was too quick to spot a slight or suspect a campaign against him. That was a serious flaw. One had to understand that military might was always subordinate to the demands of politics. There would always be intrigue, always be conspiracy. The trick was to understand it, get inside it, cultivate the right allies. Schwarzel never did. He was as clumsy with diplomacy as he was with women. Between them, Helborg and Schwarzhelm were the two mightiest warriors of the empire, unmatched by any other. And yet, they so often worked alone, driven apart both by the endless demands of the emperor and by the differences in their essential character. It was foolish, wasteful, and unnecessary. Maybe that would have to be rectified. The low-level feud was becoming damaging. When this was over, a summit would have to be convened. Schwarzelm, Helborg, and the Emperor would have to meet, thrash out some kind of accommodation. The bad blood could be drained from their triumvirate with a little imagination. The stakes were too high to let it continue festering. Let's go, Helborg said, 
taking up the reins. There would be plenty of time for reflection when the two men met again. For now, the Reichsguard was clearly needed. Averheim had the look of a city that had drifted into anarchy. That could not be allowed to continue. The day was waning to dusk. In the west, clouds barred the setting sun. Everheim was still distant. As he rode, Schwarzen felt the effects of a long day in the saddle begin to wear on his battle-ravaged body. The landscape around him looked eerily familiar. He knew he'd traveled along the same road just days before at the head of a conquering army. Now he was riding back with an escort of less than a dozen riders consumed with a mix of alien emotions. The certainties he'd enjoyed while pursuing the orcs had receded again. The further west he went, the more his mood began to return to one of darkness. The city was a curse for him, the home of the sickness that had blighted his sleep and impaired his judgment. And he was going back. The hooves of the horse thudded on the hard dirt of the track. The incessant rhythm began to have a soporific effect. Schwarzelm shook his head, trying to clear the strands of sleep from his eyes. There were many miles of riding ahead. Neither he nor his bodyguard would rest more than they needed to. They all knew time was of the essence. Weakened, the rolling hills passed by. The uplands beyond Heideck were not far behind them. All around, the cattle country extended. The grass was still deep green despite weeks of beating sun. This country was blessed indeed. The folk of the Drakwald, huddled around their meager fires and living amongst their skinny animals, would have given anything to live in such rich plenty. But there was always a flaw, always an imperfection. Amid all the majesty of the empire, there was corruption. Averland was no different. He'd felt it every night of his mission. How many days had he gone without proper sleep? Too many to keep account of. A man could only go so long before he started to lose his mind. Perhaps he was losing his mind. Others fought it. He'd heard the whispered rumors, seen the sidelong glances in his direction. Half of Averheim probably doubted his state of equilibrium. There was a shout from further ahead. One of the outriders, mounted on a sleek mount of Araby, picked for speed, was riding back along to the road to meet them. Schwarzelm called a halt. Freed from the tyranny of the whip, the horses stood shivering in the balmy air, flanks shining with sweat. The rider came amongst them. As the man approached, Schwarzelm noticed the gentle hiss of the grass around them. The fronds moved in the warm breeze like waves of the sea. The tips were tinged with the golden light of the sun, though the roots were hidden in darkness. All around them, as far as the eye could make out, they were surrounded by an ocean of grassland. It was like a scene from one of his dreams. Everything was moving, everything was quiet. "'My lord!' cried the rider. His voice sounded suddenly harsh against the soft backdrop of the scene. "'I found something!' "'It better be good!' Schwarzelm growled. His voice sounded thick and sullen, even to him. The scout experienced by the look of him and from the Averheim garrison swallowed nervously. All the same, my lord, I think you should see this. Schwarzelm looked into the west. The sun was still above the horizon. There would be perhaps half an hour of light. Just enough. Lead on, he ordered kicking his horse into motion once more. The scout turned, and the party followed him further along the road for some distance. No one spoke. The only sound was the faint noise of the grass and the breeze. In the east, far behind them, and over the distant line of the world's edge mountains, the first of the stars became visible. Night was drawing on fast. Schwarzel knew where they were headed, long before he could make out exactly what the scout wanted to show them. A few hundred yards from the road, a narrow track curved away and off into the fields. 
the earth was rotted and uneven, and the grass on either verge had been flattened recently. Without needing to ask for directions, Schwarzelm nudged his tea to follow the branching path. He soon saw why the scout had turned from the road to follow the path. Carrion crows. Dozens of them. They looked as large and ragged as vultures against the darkling sky. Some wheeled around, black in the dusk, moving in lazy circles. Others perched on the branches of the trees, looking at them intently with their glossy eyes. None of the birds uttered so much as a caw. They had the air of sentries, silent watchers in the night. Crows were as common as pox all across the empire, but these had an unsavory look. Perhaps it was the unnatural heat in the air, or the silence, or their size. Whatever it was, the effect was unnerving. I saw them from the road, my lord, said the scout. He kept his voice low, eyes watchful. There it is. A ramshackle shed, isolated in the dark grassland. The fading sunlight leaked through the gaps in the wood. It was only half a roof, and one of the walls had slumped into ruin. Perhaps it had been an old barn. Schwarzelm halted. He felt as if an icy fist had clenched around his heart. He could feel his pulse quicken. Are you all right, sir? We will dismount, he said gruffly. From here we go on foot. The men did as they were ordered. They swung stiffly from their saddles, legs sore from hours of riding. Schwarzelm felt his own frame creaking as he landed heavily on the earth. The ground was baked hard. He could feel the waves of heat rising from it. Even as the sun edged toward the horizon, Averland still sweltered. The men waited for him to move. Schwarzelm could sense their fear. He stalked towards the ruined barn. Above him, the crows circled. Their loops seemed to compress. They were inquisitive. He ignored them, but kept his hand on the sword. On the northern wall of the barn, a wide opening gaped. It was hard to see much of what lay beyond the stone door frame. The shadows were now long. A sickly sweet smell wafted across the air. For a moment, Schwarzelm couldn't place it. Was that jasmine? He went closer. The aroma was more familiar than that. It was the mark of battlefields across the old world. The reek of death of bodies rotting in the mud. That was what the crows were doing there. Schwarzelm looked up at them grimly. He'd deprived them of their meal. That, at least, was something. Have you been inside? He asked the scout. The man shook his head, looking ashamed. I... it seemed... He began, then trailed off. For once... Schwarzelm couldn't bring himself to reprimand him. A cold vice of dread was wrapped hard around his own breast. Nothing, not the last golden rays of the sun, nor the morning balm of the dusk air could shift it. He merely nodded in response. Be on your guard, then, he said, drawing on his sword. It gave a metallic rasp as it left the scabbard. Stay watchful. Turning back to the barn, he took a deep breath and ducked under the lintel. Inside, the stench was thick and cloying. Schwarzelm felt his gorge rise and clasped his hand over his mouth. For a moment, he couldn't see anything at all. Then his eyes adjusted to the gloom. Gaps in the ruined roof and the part collapsed walls let in enough of the evening light to make some sense of the interior. He couldn't see how many corpses there were, perhaps a dozen, maybe more, all men, soldiers by the look of them. Some of their armor still remained on them. Grunwald's men, some Averheim troops. Here and there a sword edge glinted. There was little flesh visible. One cadaver, strewn across the rough earth floor on his back, lay in the middle of a pool of weak light. His skin was gray. His eyes had long been pecked out by the crows, and there were holes in his cheeks and neck. 
His expression was fixed in agony. His death must have been painful, possibly prolonged. Not all his injuries looked like the work of carrion fowl. Schwarzelm felt his heart begin to beat harder. He consciously quelled it. He'd seen hundreds of bodies in his time, many in much more terrible places. This was no different. Outside the barn, the grass continued to hiss in the breeze. It was as if the place was surrounded by a host of whispering ghosts. He looked away, down at the floor for a moment, trying to collect himself. He could feel his composure fraying. The days without sleep were getting to him. Something about this whole scene was getting to him. He turned back to his men. A couple of them had followed him in and were gazing at the piled bodies with ill-disguised nausea. Others held back, unwilling to enter the stinking interior. Come, said Schwarzhelm, feeling sick at the heart. There is nothing more to see here. Once again outside, he took a deep draught of pure air. It did little to lift the sense of corruption he felt about him. His bodyguard looked at him expectantly. Was it as I feared? asked the scout, looking nervous. They were Commander Grunwald's men? Schwarzel nodded. He knew exactly what date had been. The rider sent back along the old dwarf road to request reinforcements. Each of them had been waylaid, killed, their bodies dumped in a forgotten barn a mile from the trade route. Schwarzelm himself must have ridden past the place on his journey east, oblivious to the secret contained within. Stumbling across it now was a rare chance. Perhaps more than that. Anything else? he asked. Men have camped nearby. They're long gone. We will take a look. The scout led them further from the road. Several yards down the track, there was a collection of trees, isolated in the endless miles of rolling pasture. They rose tall and dark against the sky. At the base of the trunks, there were signs of fire. Schwarzelm bent down and placed his hand over the ashes. Cold. He looked around him. Whose lands are these? He asked. One of the Everlanders answered. We're close to the Leitdorf estates. This is his family's country. Schwarzelm looked over the deserted campsite. There were more blackened circles of old fires around the edge of the trees. The grass was heavily trampled. At one stage, many men had come and gone here. The exercise had been well planned. Perhaps other bands had been active too. In his mind's eye, Schwarzelm saw Leitdorf's fat face running with arrogance and scorn. He remembered his bitter words. In my current position, I cannot punish insolence. That will not be the case forever. Perhaps even then his forces had been mobilizing. He shuffled further into the camp, studying, watching. There was little left, no weapons, no discarded clothing. He turned to leave. Sir, this one is still warm. One of the Everlanders had walked off towards the edge of the field. At his feet lay another charred circle. Schwarzelm came up to it. It was different. It was further from the camp, hidden by the whispering grass. They dug a hole in the parched earth and stuffed it with refuse. This hadn't been a fire for food. Schwarzelm bent over it. The ashes were barely warmer than the air around him. The faintest impression of heat lingered over them. It looked like a sack had been flung into the fire pit. Scraps of fabric, black and curling, lay amid the spent fuel. He thrust his hands into the ashes, scattering them, combing through the white flakes. Here and there, fragments of parchment, nothing large enough to make out. Orders, perhaps, sent by courier from Averheim. They'd been through when they left. Nothing could be made out of them. Then he saw it, mere inches from the fire, a scrap of dry parchment, no more than two inches long. Eagerly he grasped it. The light was poor 
and there was nothing much on it. It looked like a strip torn from a page. There were five words visible on it, scribbled hastily, part of something larger. Forces to R.L. from Known. That was the name he needed. Not that he'd been in any doubt, but it was the final word that chilled his blood. He remembered Verstolen's words days ago. They're getting help from outside. He'd assumed it was Outdorf, someone at court, an Averlander exile with a stake in one of the contenders. But Nuln? That was much closer. It was probably nothing, probably part of routine orders. But the ice around his heart had returned. He knew who was at Nuln. Let's go, Schwarzelm said gruffly, standing up again and walking back to the horses. His men hurried to comply. The last of the light was failing, and there would be hard ride ahead before they could rest. They walked back, past the ruined barn, through the fields, and on to the road. As they went, Schwarzelm said nothing. He didn't look back. His mind was working, running through all the possibilities. He felt the return of that great pressure, the presaging of the nightmares that he knew would come as they approached Averheim. He took a deep breath and mounted his horse. The others did likewise, and soon they were heading west once again. Behind them, lost in the night, the barn stood alone. Lazily, the crows descended to the rafters. Their meal had been interrupted, but it could now commence again.